Hi, everybody. We're here for our annual AP U.S. Government and Politics mock election. Um, it's been an interesting year, um, but we have still been around. You've seen our commercials, our polls. I'm very proud of the class for continuing uh, this legacy. So today you're going to see the two candidates, uh, Michael Ovet as Donald Trump and Joe Gindy as Joe Biden, um, engage in a debate. I do want to say up front, these are not my questions or the class's questions. Uh, I sent around a poll and students submitted about 125 different questions. And all I did was sort of combine similar questions and melt them down into the ones that you're going to hear today. But they're your questions, not mine. And uh, all time limits, everything else was predetermined. So I just want to get started and let the candidates speak for themselves. So our first question is going to go to President Trump. Okay. President Trump, your own FBI director has stated that the greatest threat to the United States is from domestic terrorist groups. Militias are on the rise, and so are anti-Semitic, racist, QAnon conspiracies, and other hate crimes. Yet you seemingly gave encouragement to the Proud Boys, and it took you two days to fully condemn white supremacy, and you are still retweeting QAnon conspiracies. How do you explain this to the American people? So first things first, thank you for the question, and thank you for having us here today. I think it's important to note, because it's something that my opponent really doesn't admit, law and order are the building blocks to the American dream. And if anarchy prevails, if anarchy prevails under the current system, under Antifa, under the Black Lives Matter alliance, this dream comes crumbling down. Anarchy in our streets is unacceptable, and anger is not enough. But lucky for you, you guys have a president committed to action. Just a couple weeks ago, 11 people were shot in 12 hours in New York City. 11 people shot in 12 hours. And 61 people were shot in the Democratic-run Chicago. And 15 people were fatally killed. These are the same cities that propose defunding the police. These are the same cities that are Democratic-run. The same cities that Joe Biden supports. I will not stand for it. I won't stand idly by and allow these Black Lives Matter protesters to chant pigs in a blanket talking about police. They chant pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon disrespecting our law enforcement like that. I've condemned white supremacy more than any other president in history. I said on the debate stage, I told the Proud Boys, I told them, stand by, stand down. I told them, we don't want, our country has no place for white supremacy, our country has no place for racism, okay, and no time place up, for anti-Semitism. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Your 90 seconds was up. Okay, a 60-second rebuttal from you, Vice President Biden. Um, you said that you said you told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand down. Uh, I just want to reiterate that's not what you actually said. You told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. Stand by for what? Your orders? Moving on. Oh. The FBI classifies these domestic terrorists as the greatest threat to America. Yet, you can't condemn the murderers, the vicious killers who tried to kidnap the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. And you even retweeted videos pr promoting these violent terrorists. And just to clear the air, I do not want to defund the police. Defunding the police would be a huge mistake for our nation. You also retweeted a video, uh, a tweet that you claim didn't matter. You said that Osama bin Laden was still alive, a QAnon conspiracy theory. These conspiracy theories are anti-Semitic at heart. They claim that the Democrats have some pedophile ring around the nation. That, that's absurd. You can't condemn it because why? Do you support it or do you support your followers who support it? Okay, thank you. That's your 60 seconds. Okay, the next question will go to Vice President Biden. Mr. Biden, President Trump has been a very good friend to Israel. He's moved the embassy to Jerusalem, facilitated treaties such as the Abraham Accords with the UAE, and other treaties with Bahrain and the Sudan. Why do you think you could be a better friend to Israel than Trump? Thanks for asking. Uh, I have a long history with the State of Israel. In 1973, right before the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, I was there. 
I was in Israel and I pled the Congress that we need aid for this state. They will become our greatest ally in the area, the Middle East. And they have. And I would never, never consider moving the embassy out of Jerusalem. It is their capital city, and that's undeniable. I think that President Trump tried to make peace between Israel and the Palestinians, but has failed multiple times. It will be a crucial goal of my administration to make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's not just about who Israel and their foreign, their foreign allies in the area. It's about Israel and their domestic policies. We have to help them. And I would never take away funds from Israel if they were to violate the treaty. President Trump, do you have a response? I do. I do. Thank you. Joe Biden says that he wants to make peace in the Middle East. But I ask you, he's been in politics for 47 years. Why has he never done this before? Why has he never attempted to make peace in the Middle East? I mean, he's actually tried. They signed the Iran nuclear deal under President Barack Obama and Joe Biden. That disastrous treaty actually gave money to Iran and subsidized them for them building nuclear bombs. I mean, thankfully my administration pulled back out of that disaster. We saved us billions of dollars and we promoted peace in the Middle East. But Joe Biden's Democratic National Convention featured six individuals who have praised, promoted, and defended the most notorious anti-Semite in the world, Louis Farrakhan. This man has called Hitler a very great man, and these are the people that the Democratic National Convention invited to speak at Joe Biden's acceptance. It's unacceptable. Luckily, you have a president of the United States in office who supports Israel, who's always there to stand by, and always there making sure that Israel is safe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, President Trump, next question for you. In a taped interview with Bob Woodward, you were heard admitting in February and March that you knew how serious the coronavirus was, yet you continue to publicly play it down even as hundreds of thousands of people have died. Even now, as cases spike up across the country, you mock mask wearing, social distancing, and claim that COVID-19 has run its course and will be over soon. How do you defend that? At a time when this country faced insurmountable challenges, it's important to express confidence. It's important to remain calm. Just days after my discussion with Bob Woodward, I said, quote, I want them to stay calm. We're doing a great job. If you look at my individual statements, that's exactly what I say. You see, I embody the American spirit that when we face a challenge, a crisis, a pandemic, we come together, we can be optimistic, but we can also be serious about it also. And that's exactly what I did. So I did what leaders do, what good leaders do. They stay calm and resolute at a time when this nation is facing an insurmountable challenge. You see, from the start, I was transparent with Americans and everything my administration has done combating the coronavirus has saved lives. On January 1st, way before there were more cases in the United States, I placed a ban on Chinese people coming to America. A day later, Joe Biden called it xenophobic. Look at the records, February 1st. And they say that this one action saved 100,000 lives. But not just that, every other thing I've done has saved countless lives. More than 115 million tests have been done to date. We've sent over $11 billion to help states and help all these medical centers. We've sent $2 billion to communities. I initiated the Paycheck Protection Program, which saved 51 million American jobs. I secured direct payments to help countless Americans who've been hurting due to the pandemic. I've done everything in my power to make sure that this difficult time is smooth sailing for all Americans, while at okay. the same time ensuring our economy is Thank you, is President right. Trump. The 90 seconds is up, but thank you. Uh, rebuttal, Vice President? Yes, thank you. Um, I did call you xenophobic, because you are, but not because of closing the border to China. That was a good thing. However, you failed to close the border to Europe, something that led to the outbreak in New York and the East Coast. That's what caused a major outbreak, not China. You keep pushing blame off of China and not accepting that you messed up. 200,000 Americans are dead, and 300,000 will be dead by Christmas. You have to take responsibility. Your administration failed when combating the coronavirus. You didn't close the border to, the, to Europe, and you failed to get a national testing program quick enough so that we as a nation could combat the coronavirus. It isn't just our job as individuals to combat the virus, it's the job of the president to 
to make sure that the people are safe. Vice President Biden. Okay, in the first three years of his administration, the economy clearly prospered under President Trump's administration. The stock market boomed, unemployment was down, and the GDP grew at an average rate of 2.5%. Why would you be a better president on economic issues? Okay, yeah, President Trump has only cut taxes for the richest of the richest of our nation. He hasn't cut taxes for people like you, people of the middle class. It's the job of the government to make sure that its people are safe and <clears throat> safe and wealthy. He shouldn't be talking about taxes because he barely pays them. Last, in the New York Times released tax returns, President Trump has only pay, paid oh, only about two, $750 in tax returns. How should, how should President Trump, someone who claims to be a billionaire, be paying less in taxes than regular Americans? It's clearly unfair. And the rate of growth in the last three years under the, the first three years of the Trump administration is slower than the rate of growth in the last three years of me and Obama's administration. It's not about whose numbers are better, but it's about whose plans will help the American people. It's not about who pays more in taxes, it's about how we pay taxes. As when I, if I become elected, I will make sure that all Americans pay their fair share of taxes. Okay. Uh, rebuttal? Sure. So just to respond one by one, um, Joe over there says that I didn't pay taxes. But the fact remains, I asked my accountants, they said I prepaid tens of millions of dollars in taxes. So now that's that. Second, my tax cuts didn't only cut taxes for the top 1%, they cut taxes all across the board. Actually, under a Joe Biden plan, we're going to see taxes being raised for people making over $400,000. But the fact remains that my economy has done better than Barack Obama and Joe Biden's economy ever did. I undid dozens and dozens of Obama-era regulations, and I reversed these negative economic trends that scarred Obama and Biden's presidency. For example, under my presidency, we had the Dow hit 30,000. Under Obama and Biden, 20,000. Under my administration, manufacturing rose 3.6%. Under Obama and Biden's administration, we lost 200,000 jobs. Before I took office in January 2017, they all said we would only make 2 million jobs by this point. You know how many jobs we made before Corona? 7.1 million jobs. Thank you. Thank you, President Trump. That's the 60 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this would be to President Trump. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has been the leader of the free world. Critics of your administration argue that your actions have caused our relationships with longtime allies like Great Britain, France, Germany, and Canada to become strained. You've repeatedly threatened to pull the United States out of NATO, and you argued for an America First policy. What do you say to these critics who argue you are diminishing America's place in the world? So first things first, I think it's important to say, and I think it's something that no one really says that much. It's important to put America first before any other country. We have to deal with the circumstances, the situations that we have in America before we can have other countries. Now regarding NATO, what you mentioned, we've been getting ripped off over eight years with Barack Obama and Joe Biden. We've been getting ripped off. The United States has been paying billions and billions of dollars to NATO, and we haven't been getting anything in return. The countries have not only been paying 0.5% of NATO's whole entire budget, while the United States has been paying more than 50. It's unacceptable. So my foreign policy will always, always be one of putting America first. We've ended endless wars. Wars. You hear politicians always speaking about it, but they never do it. But under my administration, we put American soldiers first, we put American lives first, and we ended endless wars. We've gotten ripped off, just like I've said before, I pulled out of NATO. We've secured better deals. We pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I negotiated the USMCA, which created hundreds of thousands of American jobs, once again, putting America first. I stood up to China, unlike what Joe Biden said with the coronavirus, I did stand up to China. I ensured that no more jobs were outsourced to that country, that corrupt country. Obama and Biden let China rip us off, and under my administration, that stands no more. Okay, thank you. A rebuttal, Vice President? You say that you put America first, but in reality, you really put Putin first. Putin placed bounties on the heads of our soldiers, and you said nothing about it. What war, what endless war did you end? Clearly not Afghanistan, as our troops are still dying there, where 
Putin is putting bounties on the heads of our soldiers. You say that NATO is ripping us off, where in fact, they're the only source that we could fight Russia. Russia is gaining influence. You can't deny that. And we and NATO, our allies, have to fight back. You lost to China in the tariff war. You let them choose the deals. You didn't help the American people, you heard them. The, ag the farmers of our nation are being hurt by the bad deals that you got them with China. They're being ripped off. Don't you, don't you think that they deserve better than that? Okay. Vice President Biden. This week, the Supreme Court is scheduled to hear a case brought to them by the Trump administration to possibly get rid of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Why do you defend Obamacare, and what would Biden care look like in your administration? Look, people need health care. It doesn't matter how rich or how poor you are. People need health care. The ACA is crucial during a pandemic, especially now since people are dying by the hundred thousands. The Trump administration is trying to rip away people's health care during a pandemic. It's insane. We have to protect the ACA. And under my plan, there will be a buy-in option for people who don't, who don't qualify for the Affordable Care Act, but still would like its benefits. It's important that we support people during a pandemic. By giving them health care, we're giving them support. During a pandemic, it's crucial for people to have health care. Not just any time, but during a pandemic especially, it's horrible to take people's health care away, especially people with pre-existing conditions. The Trump administration is fighting to take away people with pre-existing conditions and take away their health care. It's not only that it's not only that it's during any time, it's during a pandemic, when it's most crucial for us to protect people's health care. Okay. Your response? So first things first regarding pre-existing conditions. What he said that I don't support people with pre-existing conditions is completely false. I actually you guys can check the records. I actually just signed an executive order protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Now, Biden also said that he'll build on the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, um, as part of his Biden care. But just so you know what Obamacare did, their plan raised prescription costs, it left 10% of the population uninsured, left higher premiums, higher deductibles, and made people lose their health care plans. This is not something that we want to do during a pandemic. During a pandemic, it's especially important, just like you said, for people to be on health care. It's important for everyone to have health care. And under Biden, Biden's plan, that's simply not going to happen. On the contrary, my plan expands affordable insurance options. Right now, actually, we're working on a vaccine, a cure for the coronavirus. We should have a cure for the coronavirus, I think. I think my officials say January, March, something like that. We're going to get it in the hands of the average American. I mean, thank God we repealed their Obamacare. We got more people insured. The fact is that right now we're providing Americans Stop, with more health care options. Stop us. Thank you. Okay. And um, I believe this is the final question to you, okay? Um, the vast consensus of scientists is that climate change is real and threatens life on this planet if not addressed. Yet during your administration, you pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Accords and have reduced or gotten rid of 73 different government regulations dealing with water and air pollution, toxic substances, etc. How do you explain those actions given the threat of climate change? Do you believe that climate change is not real, not man-made? So now I just want to respond. The fact is that it's important to roll back regulations on our businesses because once we roll back regulations, then they can make the environment clean. You see, from the start, my administration has been dedicated to ensuring that America has the cleanest waters, the cleanest air, the cleanest everything. We want to be environmental friendly. I mean, it's something that we want. We have the best, right now, we pulled out of the, the Paris Climate Accords. That's true. We rolled back regulations. But you know what? It's paid off. Because under my administration, we had the lowest carbon emissions ever. The lowest carbon emissions that were ever produced in the past 35 years. And now going back to the Paris Climate Accord that you mentioned, that had us paying trillions and trillions of dollars and we were being treated very unfairly. The climate deal punished American energy producers with expensive and burdensome regulations. It gave countries like China scot-free and let them go off scot-free while they were reaping the benefits of our subsidies. 
Essentially, we would have to be paying $3 trillion by 2040 if we saved in that plan. But thank God I pulled this out. And luckily I did. I rolled back all the regulations. Yes, I did. Not because I don't care about the environment. I care about the environment deeply. That's why I'm committed to making sure that we have a clean and safe environment. But you know what? Their climate plan, actually, it says that the Green New Deal is a crucial framework for the Biden's climate plan. Crucial okay. framework? Okay, I'm sorry, that's the 90 seconds. Okay. Thank you, though. And your 60 second response? Yeah, I just want to start off by saying that I do not support the Green New Deal. I never have and I never will. The Green New Deal goes too far. But under my plan, we acknowledge climate change and we'll be prepared for the future. Look at what's happening in the South. There's these hurricanes that, you, that usually happen once every 50 years, but they're happening multiple times in one year. You can't deny that climate change exists. It's an existential threat to our nation and to the people of the world. We have to combat climate change. Rolling back regulations will not help the environment. It's important that we fix what the mistakes that your administration has made and that we are prepared for the future. Under my administration, we plan to create new jobs, jobs of the future, jobs in hydro energy, in wind energy, in solar energy, jobs that will be sustained during climate change. You can't deny that climate change doesn't exist. Every single scientist in the world says that it exists and that it's an existential threat. It's important that we acknowledge it as a threat and not just deny it like your administration has been doing for the past four years. It's ridiculous that we even have to have a conversation about whether climate change exists or not because you can't deny science. Science- Okay, thank you, Mr. Biden, thank you. And this will be your fi the final question and rebuttal of the debate. Um, so, You promised the American people your response on expanding the Supreme Court, yet you have still not given any specific answer as to what you are planning to do. What, if anything, will you do about the Supreme Court if you become president? Would you support expanding the Supreme Court, passing an amendment? What are you ready to tell us now what you would do? Look. Under my administration, I plan to create a bipartisan commission to look into whether or not we should expand the court. Expanding the court, or packing the court rather, is no new concept. John Adams shrunk the size of the court, and right after him, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, expanded it. Changing the number of justices is nothing new, but Trump's rush nomination of Amy Coney Barrett is a mockery of our Constitution. They rushed her in with only three weeks before the election. It was insane. It usually takes justice months to just get approved, but they rushed her in in three weeks. It was disgusting to watch how the, his administration nominated someone right after the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So will I expand the courts? Let my bipartisan commission figure that out. I don't think it's necessary at this time yet, but the bipartisan commission will decide whether or not the courts should expand. Expanding the courts is something that a bipartisan commission should decide, not the president and no one else. But rushing in Amy Coney Barrett was a mockery of our Constitution and a mockery of the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you, Mr. Biden. 60 second rebuttal, Mr. President. So, regarding packing the court, you know, just so you all know what packing the court is, is he's claiming that he's going to put a bipartisan commission to oversee that. But you know who's going to get to appoint those extra nominees when he decides to pack the court? He is. He is going to appoint liberal justice. He is going to appoint people who are more left-wing than centrist. You know why? Because his ultimate goal is to pack the judicial branch with nominees that can enforce his plan. But you know what? Under my administration, that's not going to happen. We're not going to pack the court. Now, going to what he said about rushing to confirm Judge Am Justice, now Justice, Amy Coney Barrett. In March 2016, even Joe Biden said that it was a president's quote-unquote constitutional duty of the president to name a Supreme Court justice, even though it's in the final year of their presidency. There has been 29 instances where there have been open, vacant spots on the Supreme Court, and every single time a president has filled them. And my term is no different. Thank you both very much. Now we have come to the part of the debate where each of the candidates is going to make their closing statements. Uh, first up, by coin flip, 
is President Trump. There's been no doubt about it. There's been no question about it. This year has been filled with unsurmountable challenges, none of which are the fault of Joe Biden or myself. But you heard me talk about today how through it all we persevered. Through it all we stuck together. Because that's what Americans do. We remained calm, but we took decisive action. And that's what we did here. We faced the biggest challenge of them all, a global pandemic. But you know what? We were hopeful and we stuck together. And that's the important part. Because you know what? Now we have, I think we have three to four companies producing vaccinations, cures for the virus. We have Regeneron, we have so many other companies producing cures and we're gonna get them into the hands of the average Americans within a couple of months. All the economic numbers you saw before the coronavirus will all come back. If elected, I'll be cutting your taxes some more. I'll be giving you incentives to work. I will bring our economy back into shape. Under Joe Biden, he's going to raise taxes for people making $400,000 or more. I'm not sure why he wants to take money out of the hands of the average American, but that's what he's going to do. I'll be giving you incentives to work. I will get our economy back into shape. We'll see the record unemployment numbers like we've seen before. If elected, I'll continue my crackdown of rioting and looting. We have no place for them in America. And just as I almost completely obliterated ISIS in the Middle East, I will continue doing so. We'll put them in jail, all the Antifa members, all the violent Black Lives Matter protesters and rioters. I'm sorry, rioters. Anyone who shouts death to America, anyone who shouts whites are pigs, anyone who displays racism or anti-Semitism has no place in our country. So if I'm elected again, the American flag will once more be the embodiment of our country. If I'm elected again, our law enforcement will be respected once more. If I'm elected again, we'll see four more years of economic growth. We'll see wages rising, tax cuts. We'll get our economy up and running. Okay, thank you. Thank you, President Trump. Thank you. Vice President Biden, your time begins now. Thank you. Look, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, but this election is about more than just that. We're fighting for the soul of this nation. This president brings out the worst in us. He uses hate and division to his advantage. The world is laughing at us right now. They see he can't handle the pandemic, but I can. I'll tackle the coronavirus and make sure America is prepared for the future. He let the American people down and failed at the pandemic. The leaders of the world know me and they respect me. I won't abandon our allies and be Putin's puppet. And I definitely won't ignore the fact that Vladimir Putin put bounties on the heads of our soldiers. He's done nothing about it. I'll bring back the jobs that he's lost and create new ones to fuel an economic boom. Jobs of the future. Jobs that will help combat climate change, something that he still denies its existence. And I'll make sure, I'll make sure that people who need health care can get it. And that if you would like to keep your health care, you can keep it. I don't support Medicare for all. I support health care for those who want it. The killings of African Americans that we have seen at the hands of police appalls me, and we, must, and we must combat the issues we see today, but not by defunding the police. He's poured gasoline on every racial fire and has called neo-Nazis in Charlottesville very fine people. He started his campaign all the way back in 2016 by calling Mexicans rapists and killers. He doesn't understand immigrants are the soul of our nation and will be incremental to our economic recovery. I'll make sure that hate has no place in America, especially in the White House. Folks, if I win, I'll unite our nation. I won't just be a Democratic president, but an American president. We can't keep going down the path we're on. A vote for me is a vote to save America. Thank you, Mr. Biden. Go ahead. Well, thank you for your attention. It was a great debate between these two candidates. And by the way, they didn't see any of these questions in advance, so that's not an easy thing to do. In any case, you're about to get a link where now you can make your decision and vote. And I hope you will all do that, and we'll announce the results later. Also, the AP U.S. Government and Politics class does this every year, so if you think you'd like to be involved in something like this, please join us. We're running a mayoral race next year. In any case, please tell your families, siblings, older cousins, aunts, uncles, everyone, if they haven't voted already, to please, please do so. Democracy only survives 
when the people are involved in the process. Thank you.